for okay. your patience. All right, so I'd like to call this uh, Committee of the Whole meeting for March 11th, 2020 to order. I'm going to ask for adoption of the agenda. So I want to make that motion, please. Councillor Shalette, seconded by Councillor Palmer. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Moving on to adoption of the minutes of uh, February 11th, 2021. Someone want to make that motion? Councillor Brooks Hill, Councillor Charlotte, all in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Moving on. Any business arising from the minutes of February 11th? Seeing none, we're going to move on to uh, delegations and presentations. Uh, Miriam Manley here from Arts Revelstoke, uh, going to do a presentation. Miriam, can I turn it over to you? You can. Thank you. Thank you. Just trying to get the screen sharing working. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. It's working. Perfect. Okay, hey, thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate your time. I know you're all very busy. Um, I am presenting to you today about Arts Revelstoke and um, we usually present annually. Um, the city do support us. So we like to just keep you updated on what we're doing. And um, I'm not talking about the overall Revelstoke cultural sector today, although I have been providing those updates to Ingrid. And I think she brought that to the council's attention at the, um, the economic COVID economic recovery session, uh, which was my update from the cultural sector. But today I'm going to be talking about Arts Revelstoke. I know most of you, but for those who I don't know, my name's Miriam. I'm the artistic and executive director at Arts Revelstoke. Um, so we previously were known as Revelstoke Arts Council, and we have spent the last couple of years working on our rebranding to Arts Revelstoke, which we just feel is a little bit more fresh and contemporary. And along with this rebranding, we've got a new website too. Um, so I encourage you to go check it out. It's artsrevelstoke.com. And um, specifically under programs, if you have a look at the residency and uh, workshop page, we have all of our past residencies there. And uh, a lot of those were helped and supported from the city's support through um, the money they give to the Performing Arts Centre to help its operation. So uh, yeah, go check those out. We're pretty pretty happy to have a new website up and running. So talk a little bit about COVID and how we've adapted. Uh, one of the first things we did when we noticed everyone was at home and artists weren't getting any, any work or support is we did a very quick Revelstoke Reflections Art Prize where we gave up prize money for uh, paintings, uh, projects, writing, poetry. And here's a few of the prize winners on the screen there. And then we had to pivot more of our programs to digital. So we had to reprogram our entire performance series for small audiences. And then when more restrictions came in in October and November, we had to pivot completely to digital. And we relaunched our Revy Live season as Revy Live Online. We've already had three uh, online performances and we've had a great uptake on that. We've had about 70 families watching live. And then we contract the artists to allow us to stream their work for 24 to 48 hours. And we have, after those initial live views, we have a couple of hundred views and lots of great comments. So we've actually been really surprised at the, the volume of the uptake on that and on the movies that we're offering. And we're offering all of this program programming free. So we are, um, we are funded to do this work and uh, we wanted to make sure we had the greatest possible accessibility for our, our programming to, to continue. So that's... That's how we did that. Guerrilla gigs. So we weren't able to do Street Fest last year. Street Fest normally attracts about 20,000 people. And on some nights we have up to 500, sometimes even pushing six, 700 people. So we obviously couldn't do, do that in COVID. So we came up with this alternative plan where we did these micro gigs in iconic locations around Revelstoke. We had local bands and bands from away. And um, we programmed them so that they were in these remote locations so that they couldn't be attract a lot of passing passes by and then we wouldn't be uh, sticking to the COVID regulations. We also filmed these gigs. So we launched a new Rebel Stoke, Arts Revelstoke YouTube channel and we hired a local videographer um, to produce really high quality videos that have been getting a lot of hits and a lot of traction. And Tourism Revelstoke are really happy with this product and they invited journalists and they invited influencers to come to the gigs. We, it was picked up by CBC and um, 
they've asked us this year to increase the number from eight to 16. And this will be local bands and bands from outside um, at these uh, sort of wilderness iconic locations. And the city's funding is helping to support this. And it also helps us as an organization continue um, at capacity to be delivering festival activity so that when COVID ends, we're still up and running and able to produce Street Fest and Luna to the same capacity that we were before. So speaking of Luna, uh, we were able to produce a smaller version of Luna, both digitally and some in-person events. And I think what was most successful over the weekend was um, our launch of our Alleries Phase 2, where we had buskers located in the downtown core. And we probably had over a thousand people pass through the alleyway on that day, but it was in a safe, socially distanced way. Um, they could come on their own time. It was spread over the day. We didn't advertise performance times. Um, but people really enjoyed just being able to engage with something in person outside rather than being just over a screen and, and over digital. So this all speaks to kind of um, the cultural resiliency that we've been working on during this time. And an example of this is right now in schools, as we speak, we've got the Oro Collective, which is a contemporary dance company, and they're actually doing Zoom workshops with our elementary school students as part of the art starts programming that we do. And they'll also be coming back um, to do a spring break dance camp. So we'll be having small groups of youth on the stage at the Performing Arts Center with Zoom, over Zoom, being taught contemporary dance and being choreographed. And then we're actually gonna film the youth doing a choreographed piece, which will then be broadcast alongside the professional show on March 26th. So we're having to really come up with new and innovative ways of, of delivering our programming. Um, we've been coordinating meetings with the whole Revelstoke cultural sector, and we're actually working with them right now on, on some celebratory programming around Indigenous Peoples Day. And then we also take part in, in, in uh, provincial and Kootenai and Okanagan uh, presenter meetings uh, where we're talking about how we can work together to get through this time. So I just want to touch on our galleries. We've done five of them so far, and um, they've been really well received by the community. The lights that we put in are all, fun, are all powered by solar panels. So it's kind of an eco-friendly project. And the response has just really been overwhelming. Like if you look on Facebook at some of our posts and some of the comments that have been coming back are just great from residents and from visitors as well. So we don't just do our galleries or the in-person stuff is great, but we also have this sort of online component. So we've made making of documentaries about each of the art galleries that we've done. And we have a 3D street view walking tour online. All of this is on the Luna website under Art Galleries. And we have a bio of the artist and a picture of the artist. And this speaks to sort of some of the more innovative digital projects that we're beginning to do. Another one is um, a project about Jenny Kiyohara, who lived and died in Revelstoke uh, around the early 1900s. And we're working with the museum and Okanagan College to do a virtual exhibit about her life. And these are some of the images here from uh, the animation that Sarah Spur um, is just wrapping up at the moment. So you'll be seeing that come online really soon and it's incredibly beautiful. So please do check that out. I also want to talk a bit about the climate action quilt. I did have a little animation uh, to play here, but it's not in my PDF. So you can check it out on the YouTube channel if you haven't already seen it. It's a cute little animation all about the quilt. This is essentially a giant community art project where every elementary school in town has made a fabric patch with their climate action change message. And um, when COVID hit and we weren't able to get into the schools as easily, we made climate action quilt tutorials, which we put online and the community were able to make patches. We also translated them into French. So then the Ecole de Glacier was able to make patches with all of their school students. We, provide all, we provided all of the materials for this. So this quilt is currently being, it's a lunar project. It's currently being sewn together at the Visual Arts Center. And ultimately it's gonna be 150 feet long. So you can see an example of, of what it's gonna look like. It's six feet wide, 150 feet long. Um, what we would like to do for Luna 2021 is install it downtown and we want to avoid the crowds of Luna and Luna attracts a lot of crowds because we have time performances. It's between 6 and 10 p.m. So it's this really intense period of time that attracts crowds and creates this great atmosphere to prevent crowds. What we want to do and what we're hoping to be able to do and we'll have to talk to city staff about this, of course, is 
shut down uh, Mackenzie between first and second for 24 hours where we install the quilt and people can come throughout the day um, to see it and to, you know each child can identify their own patch and read the other messages and some of the patches are quite beautiful and uh, then in the evening we would um, we're going to hire a commission an animator to animate the quilt and video map on the two sides of the street and also use lighting on the street as well to animate the quilt um, and we would also as part of Luna launch our next three art galleries which we're currently fundraising for and will be um, have come already to public art committee and will soon be coming in front of council so we're really excited about those too. The final thing I just want to mention is I know there's a new nonprofit in town Illuminate Revelstoke that's raising funds for um, for some more lights in town which is great um, and I wanted just to mention that um, it's really important that we have a lighting strategy that aligns with our festival and performance needs because uh, pre-COVID we were planning an 80 night street fest for for downtown and also I wanted to mention that since during my time with the Arts Council I've actually been working with the organization for nine years now I've really noticed over the last few years this real growth in our artistic and our fabrication sector here in town uh, we administer the Kootenai Columbia Cultural Alliance grant funding locally. And this year we were just overwhelmed with the number of applications and the number of really high quality applications too. A lot of our artists here in town, filmmakers and visual artists, are actually now attracting money from Canada Council um, and attracting lots of money to make films. We've got this great like young emerging film sector in town as well. So just wanted to say that when we're thinking about redoing our lighting, it would be worth consulting with the local arts community, and I'm happy to facilitate that, to talk about how our local artists and our local fabricators could be involved in the project. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for my time, and um, I really appreciate all the support we get from the City of Revelstoke. It makes such a difference to us, and I think helps to enrich the life of the community. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Miriam. Appreciate that. Uh, Council, any questions or uh, comments for Miriam? Council Palmer. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, Miriam, um, amazing amount of work in a difficult uh, year. Uh, curious, um, how many employees uh, do you have? Like, it's just amazing that you would be doing websites, uh, refresh, rebranding on top of all the challenges of reprogramming and on and on you go. I'm just kind of curious what kind of resources outside the volunteers that, that you have. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm full time and I did have a second full time person working for me, but um, due to COVID, we laid them off and I'm just about to rehire a full time person. So there'll be two full time staff and then we have um, a team of contractors working for us. So technicians um, and uh, consultants, um, artists, and um, various other people. We have ongoing contractors too, like the, the Luna team are all kind of a uh, mixture of volunteer and consulting work. And what, and what kind of budget, annual budget do you have? We have, it's half a million, 500,000. We attract, yeah. an, we attract an awful lot of funding from uh, federal funders, provincial funders, and then obviously we have our ticket revenue as well. Um, so we've actually, in my time, we've grown the organization. I, we've doubled our, our uh, annual turnover. Great. Uh, th thank you, Your Worship. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Charlotte. Thanks, Your Worship, and thanks to Miriam. It's always really cool to hear about how much culture we have in our community and how much the new the local artists do. Uh, there's been some amazing stuff happening over this last year. Uh, I'm thankful you brought up the lighting strategy. I'm hoping we can have a conversation about that as we go forward. I know it was part of the downtown planning, I believe, Your Worship. Uh, we've been talking about right. Mackenzie Plaza and what's going on there, so... Uh, I think that's going to be really neat to see. Uh, and just a quick shout out for the art galleries too. I've been listening in on the ECDEV, the BC Economic Development Summit this week. And one of the keynote speakers, I think it was yesterday, uh, from Save Your Town was talking about how these art installations can be a love letter to your community and really build that sense of place. 
And I think our art galleries are a great example of that. So thanks very much for the presentation. I'm excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, Miriam. Um, appreciate your time. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, wait, I think it was done for me. Great. Thank you. There we go. Awesome. Thanks very much. Okay, Council, we're going to move on now to uh, 9A staff reports. We have a presentation from Development Services regarding building bylaw update. Ms. Wade. Thank you, Worship. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Development Services is very happy to get this before you today to give you an update so that um, the committee understands where we're at with the update to the building bylaw review. Um, our senior building inspector, Gary Sear, is also joining us today um, for any of those real intense technical questions that you might have. Uh, I also wanted to inform everybody we have our other building inspector, Jordan Babcock, with us as our Jordan Babcock as well. Uh, so, um, given that this building bylaw really originally started in its update back in um, 2019 when we had our um, building services manager, Dan Galeen, with us, um, since we had no building inspectors for a period of time, um, and we have been able to pick this back up now that we are staffed with the building inspectors and move forward with this in line with the um, climate action plan. So we are now picking up the pieces for Council's priorities in regards to uh, sustainability and also getting um, improving our customer service for the building um, industry and meeting uh, with um, the legislation that is before us for 2022. So um, what we wanted to do today is just provide a high level overview of where we're at, the main um, key components of the building bylaw that we're looking at updating. And we're also seeking some direction for community engagement. We have um, undertaken some so far with the building industry because we're we meeting monthly with our building and developer sector. And we have already discussed the main aspects of the building bylaw with them and have been supported. So to give you a bit of a background, um, what had happened in BC in 2017 is there were some model building bylaws that were put together in collaboration with the, um, the various professionals in the industry, including the building officials, engineers, um, and architects, as well as the Municipal Insurance Association and legal counsel through Lidstone and Company. The group came together with the objectives of um, establishing three uh, types of model bot building bylaws so there could be consistency throughout BC and also that the climate action priorities of the province could be integrated into um, these bylaws in the form of the step code. Um, Council may remember that we started um, having discussions about the step code back in March 2019. We brought an update to the Committee of the Whole there was a little handout um, that we provided to all of council in regards to what the step code were, the various steps. We've held a um, our first workshop in March uh, 2019, of which the mayor spoke at, and we have been we were working diligently on that until all the staff changes in the department, and now we have picked it back up. So um, I wanted to. Um, say that the model building bylaws that we have uh, utilized in this update have been vetted by all professionals. And the idea is that this complete is consistent for all municipalities. So when the builder and developers go to the various municipalities, they have expectations on how that building bylaw would operate. In the past, there's been so many variations. It was difficult for the industry moving from municipality to municipality, and they wanted to standardize it. Um, so that was the main um, purpose of this, is standardizing it and vetting it with all professions so everybody uh, was comfortable with the model building bylaw. So in consultation with MIBC and um, our previous um, building services manager, Dan Galeen, um, we um, adopted the medium-sized bylaw, which is 
basically done by um, population, and this best fits our population and our forecasted you know, growth for the city. Uh, so that is the bylaw that we are looking at, um, that model medium-sized building bylaw. Uh, it's been um, vetted with um, the industry and the association. So we um, have been moving forward with that. In regards to the B the BC Energy Step Co, when it came into effect in 2017, they have put forward uh, targets that municipalities have to achieve. The main target for municipalities is that the Step Co three is to come into force next year in 2022, and the objective of this building bylaw update is to incorporate Step Co three into this building bylaw, which has been discussed with the building industry and is supportive. Many of our builders currently are building to this standard. So as I um, alluded to, here's an example, which is also in your report. This is a part nine building and it shows the, the phasing of the step code over time so we can get to net zero ready. The 20% more effective is for to be in place for 2022. Up until this time, municipalities have been using incentives, um, being subsidizing or um, sub partnership with um, performance-based things like building code or built blower door tests and other incentives like um, energy advisors helping to assess buildings. The idea has been to uh, gradually bring in uh, various incentives to achieve step step code one and two so that municipalities are ready for 2022 and level three. Incentives are something that we're looking at as part of bringing this um, building bylaw into, into place. And we're working with um, various partners like BC Hydro, Fortis and others in regards to um, where we can find some efficiencies and partnerships, which we would then look at targeting some of our green greening the city funds. This also rolls into um, our greenhouse gas targets, which will be addressed in the climate action plan um, and historically has been identified in the SEEP 2011. So what are the other proposed updates? The other proposed updates um, are, are re really three things. One is that we did not have swimming pools in the the building bylaw, so we provided uh, provision for that. One of the main things that we have um, discovered in our research is that currently when we use res registered professionals in mostly complex buildings, which is requires a Schedule A, they, we provide a 5% reduction in our building permit fees. Most mi municipalities um, provide greater uh, discounts in order to uh, for incentive incentivizing for the use of a registered professional and a coordinating professional. In addition, what it does is it's also that we do we do not have to do as many inspections, so there's a reduced cost to the city. So passing on that incentive to the builder is something the municipalities have been looking for. So we're um, we're recommending that we increase it from five percent to ten percent. And the other issue that has um, we want to address is the open building permits. Historically, we've had a large number of open building permits. There has been no clarity in our current building bylaw how long a building permit really can sit there unissued, and it's been interpreted in different ways. We would like to provide clarity to the industry and to staff, and we're recommending that once the building permit is ready for issuance, if it's not picked up within six months, then the, the building permit would be closed and the person or the applicant, when they wanted to come back and build, would have to reapply. So what are our next steps? Uh, staff are proposing to distribute the draft building bylaw to the building and developer community um, at our monthly meeting and have uh, asked them for a comment. We also want to post on Talk Revelstoke um, and asking for the community to provide input and then come before uh, the committee the whole meeting, hopefully in April, um, to give an annotated um, description of what those proposed building bylaw changes that we've uh, addressed today and whatever other, uh, what other other 
uh, comments we may get from the builder developer community and the community at large. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to ask any questions that you may like. Uh, Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Marianne. Um, yeah, good, good information. Um, have a couple questions. So on the, or comments, I guess, more comments and questions. The registered professional going from the 5% to 10%. So it sounds like the 10% reduction is the most common or the way the most municipalities are going. Is that correct? That'd be correct. Yeah. So I, I based on this presentation, I certainly would be supportive of that. I, I think that's good. Um, the open building permit. So that's uh, right right now you say there's a bit of confusion in, in general what is your understanding of the and how it operates today is it just really ambiguous and lasts for years or yes that'd be correct uh, we probably have had we had when i walked into the department probably over 300 um Brindlin permits that were not closed and and so we've been you know working diligently on reducing those but part of the confusion is, um, you know, how long does a building permit sit there? When staff has done all the work, it's ready to be issued and it's sitting there for pickup. And so we want to provide some clarity on that because it also affects the refunds that we can give. And it also um, gives clear messaging to the builder development community what the expectations are from the city side. So there's not any uncertainty. And the other thing is that annually the building uh, code gets updates. And so often those, if they're not issued, there could be some contradictions with the updates to the building code. So it makes it very clean and, um, and gives clear communication to the building, the builders and the developers. And, and so you're suggesting the six months um, from the time of issuance to pick up, how, lo how long would the building permit be valid after it's picked up? Two years. So once two it's years. issued, it, it's got two years. The, the, okay. problem, the problem has been that it will sit here and doesn't get issued because the applicant has to come in and pay the fees and there might be some DCC charges. So it sits and so staff has done all that work. And, we, and currently um, we collect a very nominal fee for the work that is done. So the cost recovery is very, very low in those situations. Right. Okay, so then uh, that would affect someone that puts the, you know, is enthusiastic, puts their application, but then doesn't get around to doing their work, so they just let it sit there. That that makes sense to me. The six months, um, yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and then it'd be two years from the time they paid and picked up and paid their fees. That's um, correct. Great. Uh, third question, and it's partially because. Of, partially my ignorance, but also for uh, the opportunity for uh, the community to know Talk Revelstoke. Can you just briefly explain what Talk Revelstoke is and how that works? Yes, I uh, might be happy to do that. Uh, Talk Revelstoke is our new communication platform and uh, it will help us with engaging the community in a coordinated fashion. So all our master plans or projects that the city's doing um, is on the home page of Talk Revelstoke, and each project will have its own tile page. And so you'll see like Johnson Heights Neighborhood Plan, the OCP, the Liquid Waste Treatment Plan, and you can click on that and it informs you on how to engage. It gives you the information, it updates you, it's got timelines, and it allows for people to um, communicate directly with the project lead. And that's, that's active right now, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So uh, just a suggestion, uh, Your Worship, to staff. Um, I, I was kind of vaguely aware of it. I haven't been there, but with um, I, I think that there maybe there's an opportunity through uh, social media to just remind the community. It's, it's probably become routine for staff, but uh, the community probably needs, you know, whether it's Facebook, Stoke List, or wherever, that's where people tend to engage. And um, and then it just disappears. So maybe a, just a reminder to the 
community periodically uh, on those other platforms saying this is the place to go. Thank you, Your Worship. All right, thank you. Any other comments, councillors? Uh, so, Miss Wade, any resolutions or anything you need from council at this point? No, Your Worship. Um, we're this is mainly to update you where we're at, letting you know we're working on this. This will be coming back. That we will be engaging with the builder and developer community, and we will engage with the community to start that conversation. And we have been already. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on to 9B uh, zoning bylaw housekeeping. Uh, Ms. Wade, you have something to present on that? Through your worship, um, Mr. Simon is going to present on this and we're very excited to bring this forward. And I just would like um, council to know that a lot of the uh, recommendations in here have been what we've heard over this last year. We've been gathering comments. We've been analyzing our zoning bylaw and this is our first step uh, to updating the zoning bylaw and to make it um, more adaptable to what we're seeing in the community. Uh, so I will pass it over to Mr. Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Simon. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Again, just want to confirm that everyone can see the, the presentation as it's on the screen. And as I continue to roll through the slides, let me know if, uh, if it's not changing for everyone. All right, thank you. So as Ms. Wade said, we're here to provide you an overview with where we're at in the zoning bylaw review process. So just really quickly, we'll go through what are we talking about today? What's the summary of the issue? Go through the background of where we're at with this project, get into some of the details of the discussion, um, understanding that this is the first time we will be presenting it to you. So it will be pretty high level discussion and then conclude with what the next steps are. So today we're just looking at presenting a summary of what staff will be proposing as initial amendments to the current zoning bylaw. So we are in the initial stages of what will be a full comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw. The first step will be presented today, which entails housekeeping amendments to clarify zoning regulations, um, update parts of the bylaw that are maybe outdated and no longer needed as well as introduce new housing forms, which are key priorities for council and the community. So we wanted to make sure that as part of this initial um, round of amendments to the zoning bylaw that we had addressed as many of those council priorities as possible. So a full review is a, a very complex undertaking. It requires quite a comprehensive analysis of the current land base within the city. Um, that being said, I will say that staff are, are very pleased with where we've gotten to um, at this point as part of our initial phase of this project. So getting into some of the details now about what we're actually looking at proposing amendments to in the zoning bylaw. Um, general housekeeping amendments to the zoning bylaw will be bringing forth. These are revisions that were proposed to create a more user friendly document and increase the accessibility. So we will be looking at restructuring the document um, again, kind of comparable to how you would have seen the previous amendments to the OCP that we have presented back on February 11th. Um, for the zoning bylaw, again, we're going to be looking at removing any outdated or unnecessary references that are currently contained within the zoning bylaw. There is some language in the zoning bylaw that does cause some confusion with respect to interpretation. So we will be looking at providing more plain, clear language so that applicants and staff are, are always going to be on that same page in terms of how to interpret some of those regulations. Um, currently right now to the zoning bylaw, it has had a lot of tweaks and changes to it over its lifespan. And what that ultimately results in at times is you have different staff that are pursuing those amendments is you have regulations that are dispersed throughout the entire bylaw, which can create confusion and reduce the accessibility of the document. So we will be looking at proposing amendments that ultimately seek to consolidate some of those regulations that are currently dispersed and put them into what we refer to as supplementary conditions. So one of the other items is that we're looking at enhancing the clarity of the bylaw and as well as looking at um, a pretty a pretty comprehensive review of the definitions as they're currently laid within the bylaw. So some of the amendments to enhance the clarity include inputting diagrams for things that people may be confused about how to do. So building height is always a really key one. 
Um, so building height, setbacks, vision clearance, we will be looking at putting uh, easy to read diagrams in the zoning bylaw so that those technical regulations and that those technical definitions are a little bit easier for the public applicants to understand as staff are applying them to applications. Um, regulations right now that are embedded within a use. So within each zone, there's a list of uses that are contained within that zone. Sometimes those uses will have descriptions uh, right within the permitted use itself. Generally speaking, that's that's not the best practice to have regulations embedded within a use. It's the, the planner language that we would use. So we will be looking at removing that. And as an example for council, sometimes you'll see a use personal service establishment. And then in parentheses, it'll give you a whole host of examples and what that use actually entails. They we're looking at scaling it back just to make it a little bit easier so that all you would see is personal service establishment. Um, and then similarly uh, within the definitions of the zoning bylaw, again, sometimes there is a tendency to put regulations within a definition, which again is not reflective of best practice for planning. If there are going to be additional regulations for different development activities to abide by, they should be included as supplementary regulations within the zoning bylaw rather than buried deep into a definition within a schedule of the zoning bylaw. Again, it helps with consistent administration of the bylaw, which is kind of the main theme that this first round of amendments is really going to abide by. So one of the other key things that staff will be looking at bringing forward with this first round of amendments, which does go a bit beyond standard housekeeping amendments, will be looking at addressing some of the housing options that are required within the city. So the two key fields that we really wanted to focus on with these amendments entail secondary suites. So with recent changes to the BC building code, something that we will ultimately in the future be looking for more feedback from both council and the community on is how far do we want to go with allowing secondary suites and housing forms other than a single family dwelling. So that is a that is something that we will have to deal with as part of this housing or part of this zoning bylaw update. Um, and then the other one is what we would refer to as accessory dwelling units. So having a subordinate detached dwelling on a single lot where there already exists to be a dwelling. So you've probably heard them referred to as carriage suites, laneway houses, garden suites, mother-in-law suites. We will be looking at proposing regulations for council to consider to ultimately address this housing form. So with that, we will be including supplementary regulations and one of the key things that staff will be proposing is having the regulations be flexible enough so that they can be accommodated throughout the city and that we are not being overly prescriptive to inhibit um, more innovative designs from local designers and contractors to make sure that it's fitting within um, you know the unique nature of what may exist on an existing lot given the variety of development styles that we do have within the city. So one of the other items that staff will be proposing amendments to is the parking section. So there are some um, there are some items within the parking section that do um, create confusion for applicants. So one of the things right now is that the way the parking section is broken down is instead of saying for this use, this is the parking requirements, it will say within this zone, this use has this parking requirement which makes it challenging for interpretation of both staff and applicants. So we will be looking at removing all the references to the parking requirements that ultimately delineate the parking requirements by what zone it falls within. So it will just be very clear for applicants and for staff to say the parking regulations for the following residential uses are X, Y, and Z, for commercial uses are X, Y, and Z, industrial, institutional, and so on and so forth. It will not be based off of what zone a property happens to fall within. This will ensure consistent application of all the parking requirements, regardless of what area of the city that you may fall within or regardless of what zone you may fall within. And I will note as well that this will provide a lot of clarification as well for the CD zones where they simply refer back to the general parking regulations. And then when staff go and look at the general parking regulations, 
we have it broken up by different zones and those CD zones aren't in there. So it just reduces that ambiguity that's currently existing in the bylaw. Um, so one of the other things that we will be looking at doing is proposing the addition of uses that are not currently specified within the parking section of the bylaw and adding clarity towards what those parking requirements would be. We will be looking at the process for how we collect cash in lieu and where we can ultimately allow cash in lieu to be collected. And one of the key things with the amendment staff will be proposing is getting the language of this regulation in line with the legislative requirements. Um, and then one of the other items is um, based on feedback that we've gotten from the community and applicants and council is looking at how we can have reduced parking requirements for residential and mixed use developments when they meet certain parameters. So those parameters would be walkability within certain areas of the city that are in certain proximity to a pharmacy and a grocery store, as well as providing alternative uh, modes of transportation like bicycle parking. So we, we want to incentivize developers to come up with applications that are reducing the amount of required parking on site, not to the point that it's going to generate an issue for the city, but we want to promote that walkability with developments that have access to those easy services within a, a within a 500 meter radius is generally best practice. So one of the other items, again, in response to concerns from council and the community, the staff will be looking at bringing amendments forward for consideration is with respect to food security. So again, this is kind of a starting point for staff. These are some of the what we would refer to as low hanging fruit that we think we can achieve as part of these amendments. We will be looking at making additional allowances for greenhouses within residential areas. One of the um, current challenges within the bylaw is the restrictive nature for accessory buildings and not allowing it within front yards, for example. So we will be looking at providing some further guidance that can ultimately be considered by council as part of these amendments. Uh, we will also be looking at proposing amendments that would permit urban food production, generally crops. So this wouldn't entail any forms of animal agriculture, but just have a blanket statement in there that says this is permitted within all zones. Um, again, you know, the whole question of animal agriculture, that's something that needs to be delved into a little bit further, but this is something that staff are, are quite confident in and that we would really like to propose forward for council consideration. So you will see that with the proposed amendments. Um, so that's a, a general overview. I will say that there are um, some other more technical administrative amendments that are in there, looking at reconciling a lot of the definitions to make sure that it's consistent throughout the bylaw. Um, they're not any changes that are looking at changing the objectives or the overall intent of the bylaw. They are merely to provide that clarity. Um, so the next steps with this is staff would bring forth a subsequent more detailed report to committee of the whole. We would be targeting April for this. Um, and we would be looking at potentially having, uh, if not a draft form of the bylaw, a lot more detailed regulations that council would be able to uh, review and provide some subsequent feedback on from those main points that we talked about today. We will also be seeking feedback from council on what level of engagement, again, because while a lot of this is housekeeping amendments, as we would refer to them as, there, there are some substantial changes such as the accessory dwelling units that staff will be proposing. So we will be seeking some additional feedback from council on further engagement. Thank you, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Simon, appreciate the report. These are things that definitely council has been uh, looking forward to seeing. So we appreciate you uh, uh, bringing this forward. Uh, Councillors, any other comments or questions for Mr. Simon? Councillor Charlotte. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, this seems this this is great. It, like you said, this is exciting. It's exactly what we've been asking for and pushing for. Uh, it's nice to see it come forward. Uh, it seems pretty high level. So I'm assuming now. Is, I'm not wondering is is there any specific direction that staff are looking for, or is this just to keep us in the loop? Because um, there are a couple of questions I have. I'm really interested in that urban agriculture bylaw idea, uh, especially when it comes to making sure that it, the use is not just permitted, but it has all the resources it needs to be able to be successful. Uh, 
through your worship to Councillor Sherlight. Uh, again, the whole idea is to inform Council right now as to where we are at in the process. You will be getting more detailed report. Um, we have been working through the, the draft bylaw. It is a, a very, very highly technical document and staff do want to make sure that we have done our due diligence on it and that once we bring it forth to, to Council for consideration, we will have a bylaw that will be implemented without um, any challenges should Council choose to go ahead with it. But that being said, we do have um, a pretty good idea of some of the, the regulations, obviously. So we are able to answer questions should you have them right now. Um. Okay, uh, I'm just wondering when we're talking about crops being permitted in uh, residential zones or in various places, uh, is there going to be any language around the concept or the idea of farm sales? So through your worship, essentially right now we're just concerned with getting the use in there and that it would be predominantly for personal use. The whole discussion about having farm gate sales, farmers markets, um, that's something that's a little bit more in depth to determine where it is appropriate. Um, and then the other question, if you know, we have had some people that are inquiring about it, um, you know, what constitutes a, a home occupation, right? So those are items mm -hmm. that we need to reconcile. The, the key right now is we are looking at promoting food security, obviously. Mm -hmm. So this is from from staff's view, quite a quite a low hanging fruit just to say, food production within all zones for you know fruit and vegetables is permitted, and generally the expectation is that it would be of a non commercial nature. But that is right. something that as we work through the whole comprehensive review staff will mm -hmm. need to ultimately bring forth a, a framework to deal with that and determine where it's appropriate. Wonderful. Uh, and your worship, one follow up question just around the idea of irrigation, because uh, I believe at the moment irrigation is not permitted. Uh, if we're starting to get bigger than a small garden, though, what does that look like? Is that described in the zoning bylaw or is this part of something else? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Sherlad, that is a, a servicing standard item and I will say that development services, because we have had some inquiries um, specifically within the Big Eddy area about how this would work um, and development services has been working in tandem with the engineering group to ultimately okay, see how this could be addressed. So there are some, some different options, metering is always an option, um, but mm -hmm. staff would um, be looking at getting direction from the engineering services group and working with them to answer these questions um, prior to bylaw adoption. Okay, so it will be covered as part of the bylaw then? Yeah, so, uh, so through your worship, it's not something that would necessarily be, um, be, it's not preferred to be putting it work within the zoning bylaw because the zoning bylaw is saying you can do this, you can't do that. It really right. is a servicing standard question, right? Okay, but at least it's been looked at. Yes. Wonderful, right. thank you. Councilor Palmer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, good stuff. Um, you, you referred to housekeeping and amendments. Uh, it sounds like this is Grandpa who's been living on his own for a very, very long time and is now moving out and we need to go in the house and basically bring the dumpsters and throw everything away and repaint the place. Sounds like pretty, pretty uh, big housekeeping and big a, a lot of amendments. Is that a reasonable description of that? I, through your worship, Councillor Palmer, I can I can speak. You know, in my last year here, implementing the provisions of the zoning bylaw, we have identified numerous items that give us challenges on a day to on a day to day basis. This is a, a bit beyond housekeeping, but I will say there has been great lengths undertaken to ensure that the intent of the bylaw as it's currently drafted has not been altered in, in a meaningful way other than some of the high level items that we've identified here. The, the key with a full comprehensive review is, you know, we have, I believe off the top of my head, 12 or 14 standard commercial zones. You know, a full comprehensive review is gonna be looking at consolidating a lot of those zones, looking at significantly amending the regulations within our residential zones, which would all relate to the density that we're proposing within certain areas. So those key items that really have an impact on the development form, other than how staff have outlined it in this report, 
are not being altered within the, the current bylaw. But I, I will note, um, you are correct, I would definitely categorize this as a bit beyond standard housekeeping amendments. Um, but that being said, in my professional opinion, it is um, very timely and very needed and would generate uh, a lot of captured efficiencies for both staff and applicants in terms of uh, current challenges with administering the bylaw. It, it, and thank you. I would uh, add that it will be very helpful for council uh, because I, I agree that it's well overdue for uh, this this major major cleanup, and I'm glad that it's happening. A few specific questions, uh, timelines. When do you do you have an uh, anticipated timeline for uh, adoption? And I and I and I guess there's a secondary question with that is. Uh, it, 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 even though we're talking about housekeeping and amendments and not not substantive changes, uh, are you looking at repealing the entire bylaw and re having a refresh? Or are you going to be uh, going through a painful uh, red line of bunch of stuff? Uh, through through your worship, Councillor Palmer, staff's plan is to present this in a very similar way to how we presented the OCP housekeeping amendments, which would have been just before your time on February 11th. We will be proposing it as a full repeal and replace. Uh, it makes it a lot easier administratively to convey that. It makes it a lot easier, I think, adoption-wise as well to understand um, what is, is being presented. And for your, your first question, in terms of anticipated adoption, again, we are at the very early stages. We don't have, you know, the committee isn't even being presented a, a draft bylaw today. I think that at the next committee of the whole meeting, once we get direction from council about how engagement is to unfold and what the results of that engagement ultimately are, we would have a much better idea about the sequencing of how this bylaw could be brought forward. And I, I just noticed Miss Wade has had her hand up and she might want to add on to my answer right now or my previous answer there. Miss Wade. You're muted. Thank you. You're Thank, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Mr. Simon had said. So, um, to in response to Mr. Uh, Councillor Palmer's um, questions. So this is very similar to the OCP, where you're quite right. Um, there's been a long period of time and a well-needed um, effort to bring this into what we would call a, a baseline zoning um, bylaw update. So that from here, then as we go through with updates with the OCP, we can look at the various land use categories and and change them as we go through. So we'll do it in a very systematic manner so that we're not um, trying to change the world overnight <laughs> because there's a lot to do. And we're, and we're in the, it's very timely right now with the OCP and the master plans. And so it'll be well informed as we move forward with the, the various land use segment updates as we go forward. Thank you. Mr. Palmer, do you have a follow-up before I go to Councillor Brooksville? Uh, you can go to Councillor Brooksville. I do have more after, though. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Brooksville. <laughs> so, um, first off, I, I'm, I'm really happy to see this coming forward, and there's a lot of good things in here. And um, as has been pointed out to Council from staff numerous times, this kind of thing is just going to make staff's job much easier which i think is going to benefit uh the entire community and staff uh, i have a couple of questions or comments type things to do with the housing options section um i'm just wondering what the rationale is behind having garden suites only be a single story whereas a carriage suite is going above a garage so it's a multi-story building i'm just wondering what the rationale is behind limiting the garden suite to a single story yeah. uh, through your worship to councillor brooks hill the whole intent is to regulate the development form right so it's anticipated the way that we're proposing to roll out the regulations is that with on within a, a standard single residential lot where there's an existing dwelling you can have one of the three types of an accessory dwelling unit. You can have an, a secondary suite. You could have a garden suite, which would be a single story detached dwelling, as you mentioned, or you could have a carriage suite, which would predominantly be uh, you know, a suite above a garage. 
the whole idea is you want to ensure that it is subordinate to that principal dwelling unit on site. So if you start allowing a, another detached secondary dwelling unit that is two stories, where both stories are, are livable space, you are getting away from that now being a subordinate dwelling unit, and you're just allowing two standard single family dwellings on a lot. So the whole idea is to keep it secondary to that predominant residential use that's occurring on site, which would be a single family dwelling. And with the garden suite, it's very typical that they would be one story. But again, an owner would have the option to do either or a carriage suite or a garden suite on their lot. OK, yeah, I I suspected that was the rationale. I just wanted to kind of hear it clarified. But um, if I might continue. Go ahead. So I know, um, you know, like a downtown typical lot you wouldn't want a garden suite and a house with a secondary suite, but you know, there are larger lots available in town, existing lots that would have room to reasonably have, you know, there's like one acre lots, so you could reasonably have essentially two houses on them. I, I'm just wondering, would that still be available if someone were to apply for some type of variance or would it just not be allowed? Through your worship, the, the whole idea is that you're regulating it based on what zone it would fall within. And then you have your, you're supporting your supplementary regulations. The whole idea is that you would do it um, to preserve a certain residential character and a certain development form within an area. The challenge that staff would have if you start having lots that are a bit larger that can have a single family dwelling with a suite in it and then have a detached uh, carriage suite you're you're changing the nature of that parcel from what should be single family to a multi-family parcel and that should be going through a public process so the second part of your question about a variance you would ultimately be altering the use or altering density which would not be permitted through a development variance permit so the key is if someone wants to have more units than what would be prescribed for with what staff are proposing, they would have to go through a rezoning process because you're starting to get into that realm of your multifamily development, whereas these regulations are intended to be applicable for the, the standard single family lot so that we're maximizing the use of that single family lot. I think that that's something that should be clarified, right? So these regulations that would allow a suite, a garden suite, or a carriage suite, so you get one of the three, it would be for lots that have a single family dwelling. So it would be on those typical R1 lots that we are seeing throughout the city, so that we're maximizing the use of them and we're starting to look at increasing, you know, rental accommodation, ability for people to have a, a mortgage helper. Okay, yeah, th thank you very much for that clarification that makes sense to me so if you know someone had a double sized lot they could either rezone it or subdivide it into two lots there essentially is options there but it's yeah no that makes sense to me one final question so a single story garden suite would that be allowed to have a basement uh, through your worship it would depend on what the nature of that basement would be if someone wanted to do a little crawl space for storage, that's something that could be considered. But if it's going to be used for residential occupancy, um, you know, we'd have to look at what the size of it would be, what size it is in comparison to the existing single family dwelling on site. Um, but there wouldn't be, the way that the regulations are currently crafted, there wouldn't be a specific prohibition against it. It would be based on the, the size and what we would refer to as the, the floor space that is intended to be for occupancy purposes. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so just a little bit more on the, some of the details. So you made reference to the uh, secondary suites. Um, and uh, I noted in uh, the OCP, so there's a, a, some wording about encouraging some of those changes. So this sounds like it's one that's uh, some changes that are, are maybe more substantive uh, in bringing the zoning byline and 
conformity with the the OCP. Um, so I, I'm encouraged to hear that, uh, and I think with the the one that we have first and second reading on currently, uh, that there's a little bit of controversy around that, and I think this would be consistent consistent with what uh, my understanding of what the developer was intending. So. I, uh, I, that's sort of an interesting um, sort of concept. Also on the parking, um, I need to think through what what you were saying about having them sort of the, the consistency throughout the whole city rather than by zones and, and that kind of thing. And I understand that. Um, at the same time, when, uh, when I look at densification uh, closer to the downtown where the, there's more opportunity for walkability, say compared to Big Eddie, um, that maybe it makes sense to have some provision in, in areas. So it's just a thought. I, I can see where there could be a bit of ebb and flow. Um, I guess coming out of both of those, um, because there there is some, some potential that there's opportunity for to making some incremental changes that are consistent with where we're going as a society and uh, uh, and with the OCP. And I'm I'm just wondering if for, if we will be having more dialogue or is that, are we going to be waiting for the uh, a draft bylaw? And then if we start if council starts chopping that up, that makes it that's kind of difficult, right? And so it might I'm I'm just sort of thinking that maybe we want to have. Uh, a, a session or two in, once you get into the details so that we understand that before the the first bylaw comes. And so those are just some some concepts there. Um, and, and I think uh, Councillor Chile was also mentioned about food security, you know, those kind of things. So maybe there, maybe we should have another session on that and drilling down into the more specifics. Um, yeah. Uh, Mr. Wood, Ms. I, okay. Mr. Simon, go ahead and then Ms. Wade. I say I can answer um, the first technical question, but the latter question about having another working session, I will leave for um, Ms. Wade. But for the first question, I will say staff um, acknowledge that there, there may be a reason where in certain areas of the city, the parking regulations um, could differ, but staff are looking at having that dealt with through subsequent regulations. So for instance, the walkability feature where we say for these certain forms of development, if you achieve these walkability parameters, then your parking requirements are reduced. So we would rather have that as, as regulations and what staff view as the appropriate way to go forward. And that's why we'll be proposing it to council that way, rather than saying within this zone and this zone, your parking requirements are reduced if you do this. It makes it um, much simpler from a bylaw administration perspective should zones change within the city over time? And I will um, allow Ms. Wade or, or Ms. Lowe to answer the, the other question about a subsequent working session. Ms. Wade. Thank you, Your Worship. So the idea of bringing this forward to Community of the Whole today was to give a high level to um, communicate what staff has heard from the community and from council and how we can best um, amend this uh, zoning bylaw so it's user friendly, provides clarity, and is easy for in interpretation for staff and the community so that it is um, more consistently implemented. The next step of this will be that it'll come to Committee of the Whole, very similar to uh, what we did with the OCP, and we would have a series of the proposed changes and it'll be annotated, and we have a summary and we would talk about this, and then we will look um, to discuss an engagement um, process with the committee so that we can move this forward as to how we would engage with the community and using also our, our standing committees of council as well, and so that we can move this forward to have a, a fulsome engagement process. Um, we would look to um, the committee to uh, discuss some of the components that we're bringing forward uh, next month and have a conversation about those aspects when you have more clarity to the document that we've been working on as per what Mr. Simon is saying and we'd have a more robust uh, conversation about it. Um, so I hope that answers Mr. or Councillor Palmer's um, questions in regards to how we're going to move forward with this and we're very aware of the engagement process that has to occur as we move forward with this. Councillor Palmer. 
Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, that your your answer to the parking made made sense to me. Uh, that made a lot of sense. And again, when I think back to the OCP, at least the current OCP, uh, it, that is consistent with the wording there as well. So that's helpful. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wade, on uh, the the engagement. I that satis definitely satisfies me. Thanks. Good work. Any other comments, councillors? Okay, thank you, Mr. Simon and Ms. Wade. Uh, appreciate the uh, the report. We're gonna now move on to the next one, uh, Parks, Rec and Culture, Columbia River Bridge Mural Project. So, uh, Councillor Elliott. Uh, Gary, thank you. Um, just a quick question. Uh, when we started on the council, we had a, a bit of controversy with a, a trailer park that was uh, sold and, and there were some residences that were lost. Do you think uh, the new uh, bylaws will uh, give any new attention to that area? And, I, and also on that is, is the tiny home sort of movement that's sort of come up. We've uh, gotten a lot of interest, a lot of expression of uh, that they want to move forward on that. Does the new bylaw going to bring any 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 new aspect to it that we haven't addressed already? Mr. Simon or Miss Wade, do either one of you want to uh, venture out with us? Uh, through your worship, I see Ms. Wade has her hand up. I think we have the same response to that. Okay, Ms. Wade. Through your worship to Councillor Elliott, um, yes, we will be looking at that zone as we go through the, um, the, the next phase of our zoning bylaw updates. We have found some inconsistencies in some of the wording in the R5 zone, which we will clarify in this housekeeping one. Um, but th there is a, a larger issue with the mobile home because there's also um, the zoning and there's also a mobile home policy slash bylaw that we have to address as well. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding tiny homes, um, the tiny homes are regulated um, under various um, various aspects. One is um, the CSA and the other one is if you're going to do it and it is a part nine, there's various requirements. So currently um, the tiny home movement um, has to be certified under either aspects and have that certification to move forward. We are going to look at various housing forms as we move forward in our next segment of the zoning bylaw update, but there's very much a regulatory um, building safety component that has to be adhered to by those people that are proposing it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wade. Any uh, further comment, Councillor Elliott? No, it's good. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Brooks-Hill, do you uh, have your hand up? Oh, sorry, I never took it down. All right, good, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Wade, Mr. Simon. Ms. Donato, we'll uh, go to you, thank you. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for general discussion purposes, I've just brought forward a staff report outlining an inquiry that I received from MCON services for a mural project for the abutments under the Columbia River Bridge. As most of you are aware, the abutments under the bridge are constantly plagued with graffiti. The bridge is owned by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and it's maintained by MCON. And in speaking with the representative from MCON, they've indicated that dealing with graffiti in this area is just a perpetual cycle. The area gets tagged with graffiti. They go in, remove the graffiti. Next couple of days, it's tagged again. It's really difficult to stay on top of it. So they've reached out to the city to initiate discussions around a mural project for the area. Um, it's known that murals are one way to, com to combat graffiti and to aesthetically um, enhance an area that may be underutilized. Most of you may be aware that when the water levels are low, a lot of people recreate in that area. They're out there walking their dogs, just hanging around the river area. So it's actually a really nice area. Um, I've had some initial discussions with the Public Art Committee regarding this inquiry and the Public Art Committee is really supportive of it. We've discussed potential themes. Um, one theme in particular is an ad Indigenous mural of some sort painted by an Indigenous artist 
and I've had that conversation with MCON as well as a representative for Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and all parties are on board with moving forward with something like that and they're really um, happy to work with the Public Art Committee in getting an RFP together and it's something that they've reached out for assistance with. So I basically just wanted to have a general conversation with the committee on what their thoughts were around that, if there was any red flags, any concerns, any input before we go too far in the process. Um, most of you are aware with the process. So when I do get an inquiry like this, I will ask the um, applicant to provide some information that I take to the Public Art Committee and then the Public Art Committee will make a recommendation for Council and ultimately Council will have the final approval on the artwork to be installed. But before I go too far, I just want to make sure that the committee is on board or it's something that you would like to see there. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, Mr. Nano, just uh, one question. When we were talking about abutments, are we talking about all of the pillars under the bridge? Each one of those would be painted, or uh, is it just the area that's kind of near Woodenhead Park that would be done? Uh, what What's the thought on that? It's actually the area across the bridge, across from Woodenhead Park. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the abutment they're going to start with. There's actually two that are really bad, and... I don't think I attached the photos of them. My apologies, I should have attached the photos, but there's two abutments that they're gonna start with. And then we'll move forward from there and kind of gauge the level of support for the project and then initiate further discussions with them. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, awesome. And I do personally like the idea of indigenous art on that sort of thing. It's uh, kind of a great way of uh, of allowing the history back into the community through that artwork. Uh, councillors, any further comments for Ms. Donato? Councillor Palmer and then Councillor Brookshill. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, Ms. Donato. Um, Maybe we could uh, get a budding uh, Banksy, uh, local Banksy, to come in and save ourselves a lot of trouble. Just get the graffiti that's uh, high value. Um, the uh, On a more serious note, uh, I was wondering about something that I've wondered about some time ago is our, uh, our grizzly bears, the molds for those. Do we know where they're at? Um, and I, going on top of the bridge, there's the ugly, ugly uh, sort of cable, those big concrete things that are holding the cables uh, for the bridge. And it just it was just an idea if we could create the bears, the grizzly bears from the existing molds. But it's kind of more of the for the arts people to think about those things. But I'm just wondering if we know if those molds uh, still exist. Through your worship, I am not sure. I'd have to do some investigating to see where they're at. Anything Thanks. further, Councillor? Okay, Councillor Brookshill. I just wanted to say that I, I, I fully support this. Uh, I've seen it in a lot of places um, where the best way to get rid of graffiti is to put up good graffiti, basically. So, what? <laughs> My only comment would be that if we're going to put up a mural, if it has more of that, I would say, graffiti look as opposed to a, um, you know, more moderate mural, it will probably be less likely to get tagged over. But that's just my opinion. And uh, yeah, thanks. I think this is great. All right. Great. Any further questions? Seeing none, Mr. Nato, do you want to move on to the uh, heritage uh, panel report, please? Thank you, Your Worship. This report is just before you to provide you an update on an initiative to refurbish eight existing heritage panels along the river trail system and to add an additional five existing panels to the inventory. The project will be led by Kathy English and Rob Buchanan. 
The existing panels were installed over 10 years ago, so they've met their life cycle. The project will be will consist of just replacing the panels and the frames. The content info will stay the same. We're also going to install five new panels and they'll be installed at the Farwell Town Site location, which is between the Bigotty Bridge and the CPR underpass, the courthouse, the golf course, Queenie Park and Farwell Park. Funds for the existing panels and four of the new panels have been secured through the Resort Municipality Program. And for the fifth panel, which is in Farwell Park, that that panel will be expensed out of the Parks and Rec budget and will just um, mark the story of how the Dokies came to be the caretakers of Farwell Park. Basically just paying tribute to the years of service that they had when they maintain the park system. So just for information. Great, thank you. Any comments or questions, councillors? Okay, thanks again, Ms. Donato, appreciate that. Uh, let's move on to the public art policy amendment report, please. Uh, okay, great. So this report, um, in discussions with the Public Art Committee, we went through the locations for potential art installations in the public art policy, and they've identified a new location, has a potential site for public art, and it's the area between 4th Street and the 5th Street walking path where the new roundabout is. Um, Currently, the area, the landscaping in that area has not been completed, but they've identified that as a visible site for public art and would like to pursue bringing forward an amendment to the public art policy to include that location. So if council has any questions or concerns around that, I'd be happy to address anything right now and then move forward with um, a recommendation. Hey, I'm definitely supportive of that sort of thing. I think it would be good. Council, any comments? Councilor Charlotte. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, I think uh, sitting around the Arts Council or the Public Arts Committee table, we had a good conversation about this. There's so many cool pieces of art that we could put around our community, and this seems like a great new spot, uh, as well as a few other ideas. But um, yeah, just fully in support, and I hope we can really beautify that corner of our community. I think there's a huge opportunity with that strip uh, just to see what it can be and really make it sure it's a fun little center of our city. Great. Thank you. Any other comments, councillors? Support for Ms. Donato's uh, amendment for this? I'm seeing thumbs up. All right. Thanks, Ms. Donato. Is there anything else you need from Council? That would be it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you again for your input. All right, let's move on to departmental updates. Fire, uh, Chief Rousseau. Good afternoon. I have a presentation to share with you this afternoon. Hopefully I can get this up on your screens. Right. Thank you, Chief. We and have it up in front can... of us. Perfect. Okay, so uh, each year this annual report is provided to help the Council stay informed and knowledgeable about the Fire Department's activities and statistics. Uh, this year, uh, this report is for 2020. Yep, there we go. So the uh, State of operations, uh, sorry, this is going to be a summary of the six reporting categories. The state of the Revelstoke Fire Rescue Services. An overview of the incident response and breakdown of call types. A snapshot of the Fire Prevention Division's activity and overview of reportable fires and insurable values at risk. A summary of the training achieved in 2020. And how the Revelstoke Fire Rescue manages our firefighters health and safety. So Council uh, established Revelstoke Fire Rescue Services as a full service level uh, fire department in 2015. 
And to achieve that, we utilize both full-time and volunteer firefighters to deliver this level of service for our community. This means that Revelstoke and CSRD Area B residents are served by qualified and dedicated firefighters equal to many citizens, cities in BC, uh, Canada, and the USA. So it's the same standard pretty much across the country. We have uh, five full-time firefighters, one temporary flex firefighter, two assistant chiefs, a dispatcher clerk, and myself as the fire chief. We have currently 31 volunteer firefighters, and that includes seven recruit firefighters in training. Of the 394 total 911 incidents in 2020, there were 31 fires, uh, including 10 residential fires, six commercial fires, and six vehicle fires. So these are the types of fires that are uh, the highest risk to life and property. Of the previous uh, four years, only 2017 reflected higher numbers with 16 residential structure fires in that year. So a closer look at these numbers provides us some insight uh, where to focus our efforts to be best able to respond most effectively and efficiently. And you can see at 115 motor vehicle incidents made up just under one third of our annual call volume last year. 12 of those MVIs required extrication equipment to free and trap victims. Four of those extrications were within the municipal boundaries. This chart shows the percentage of call types uh, by category. So again, reflecting the 30% for MVIs as the total of all calls. Next is fire calls and alarms activated at 28%. These are the calls that uh, initiate a general page for all firefighters and volunteers to respond. And emergency medical responder account for 18% of all car calls annually these are critical intervention medical calls uh, that require two full-time firefighters to respond the purpose of fire prevention and life safety inspections uh, is to prevent fires from before they start to stop them before they start so you can see of 170 fire and life safety inspections that were done in 2020 67 of those required a follow-up inspection to verify all the identified hazards were remedied to satisfactory. Um, if you noted the graph on the previous slide shows a continuing decline of total incidents. However, one thing that we found this year, the OFC is reporting that there's actually been an increase in the residential fires throughout BC during the pandemic period, which is unfortunate. So we're watching that. Of course, with the the uh, pandemic and person visits to schools were postponed. Some of the schools were closed. I don't know if Revelstoke was, but what the uh, fire prevention officer did was actually uh, work with our dispatcher to uh, hold, uh, I believe, like an online contest where kids submitted their colorings and they were, uh, uh, I think there was two winners from each school that might be might be wrong on that, but the coloring contest winners uh, got a visit from Sparky and the fire chief with ladder six. So he doesn't look very happy there at all, does he? One thing that we do is local assistance to the fire commissioner. You'll hear us refer to LAFC periodically. Uh, so the local assistant to the fire commissioner are mandated to investigate and report on certain types of fires and losses. And you can see in the picture there, that's actually a training fire that was lit for uh, in fire investigation courses. In 2020, Revelstoke had 22 reportable fires and one uh, fire fatality was included in that. Back one. So this table shows our estimated fire losses uh, for 2020 and a comparison of the prior four years. One of the possible factors in increased losses reported may be a reflection of rapidly increasing property values. The critical thing here to note today is that nearly half of the 907,000 estimated losses were uninsured losses. So that's 450,000 of those losses did not have insurance.
The minimum level of training uh, for the full service operations fire department is mandated under the OFC's uh, Structure Firefighters Competency and Training Playbook. That's part of the uh, full service level that we did, talked about earlier. So Revelstoke Fire Rescue does train its members in accordance with the mandated level and training established uh, by council uh, to meet these requirements. Unfortunately, in 2020, in-person training uh, was initially cancelled uh, early in the year to comply with the provincial health orders and also to reduce the risk of transmission to our members. Throughout the year, many of the fire departments, including Royal Stoke Fire Rescue, adopted a blended online and distance learning as the pandemic continued and throughout the remainder of 2020 and well into uh, 2021. I believe we're going to use uh, a, a blended version here for quite some time until we have a higher level of confidence and get those vaccines rolling out. In late summer, the emergency scene management course was brought into uh, Revelstoke for our firefighters to enhance their uh, incident command and fire control team leader skills. And then in uh, early October, the emergency vehicle operator, pumper driver operator skills were uh, training were brought in to uh, ensure that the safe and effective use of the full capacity of the city's firefighting apparatus. The fundraising in 2020 was successful despite the limitations of the health orders and the physical distancing that were enforced. The firefighters raised uh, just over $6,300 in donations for the BC Burn Fund and Muscular Dystrophy Canada. And in December saw what we hope is Revelstoke's first uh, annual Santa run. It was well enjoyed by thousands of people. Um, the live feed on Facebook gave many, many people an opportunity to actually have a virtual ride along and the fire truck uh, was very exciting for kids of all ages. I believe we had 137 uh, people viewing the live feed while we were going through uh, Revelstoke, so that was great. Sometimes firefighters witness the worst day of someone's life. Uh, this does take a toll on the first responders and it reflects the high risk work that firefighters do. Uh, there were six critical incident stress sessions that resulted from incidents where our members attended that also shared in those traumatic experience events. And so Revelstoke Fire Rescue supports the mental health of our firefighters and staff through our trained peers and also professional resources to maintain a healthy and safe work environment where our members can obtain support and treatment without prejudice. Um, on the screen there is the first responders uh, anti-stigma campaign. Firefighters are some of the worst and we encourage everyone that uh, needs to reach out for help to do so and that website there, the BC First Responders mentalhealth.com is just one of the resources that is provided for our, for our teams throughout British Columbia and in fact Canada. In closing, I uh, would just like to recognize Mayor and Council who continue to show their unwavering support of the fire department and for the firefighters who are dedicated to serving the community, making this a safer place to call home. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chief DeRosse. Um, two things. Uh, first of all, I'm going to compliment you for taking care of your staff. I know I've said this before. Uh, some of the things that the staff see during the course of their work or their volunteering is uh, unprecedented and uh, some, sometimes it's very hard for uh, people like myself who uh, deal with this every day to get through, but to see the volunteers and appreciate the fact that you have something in place for them. So thank you for that. Uh, one question I do has, when, when we're talking about insurance and uninsured properties that, uh, that the firefighters have to deal with, is there any uh, consequences for the city when you're dealing with that sort of thing? Is there any f reflection back uh, either from a financial perspective or in a perspective uh, when your firefighters on scene about safety, that sort of thing? Your Worship, there are uh, several concerns that I can think of immediately. Uh, one of those is cost of investigations. 
uh, there could be additional costs that would not be covered under the uh, fire insurance, for example. Most, uh, I think the easiest way to explain is that when the fire pager goes off, the authorities bestowed by the province through the Fire Services Act uh, do mitigate a lot of the, the risk to the city, assuming, of course, that the fire chief or the incident commander, the officer in charge at the scene is making the correct decisions with due diligence and, uh, and due consideration. The, the risk is very low, but there certainly are some costs uh, that could be associated with fire investigations and those sorts of things, even if there is no insurance, those events uh, and functions do need to take place. Uh, sometimes there is a recovery from the insured. If it's not insured, there's no option for recovery. Great. All right. Thank you for that comment. I appreciate that. Council, any uh, comments for Chief DeRossi uh, regarding his report? I see none. Uh, Chief, oh, uh, Councillor Elliott, you have your hand up. And Councillor uh, yes, Yes, Your Worship. Uh, Steve, Stephen, I'm just curious. Uh, we have uh, 115 motor vehicle responses. Is it standard practice for the, the, our fire department to respond to an accident on the highway? Is that every time there's an incident, the fire department goes out? Through Your Worship to Councillor Elliott, uh, yes, we have uh, a, an agreement with Emergency Management BC that we will respond to approximately 263 kilometres of highway corridor uh, surrounding Revelstoke. And so we get a reimbursement uh, per call, usually uh, one hour or less is the standard. Uh, but if we're out on the call longer than that, the, the reimbursements go up. Some of those reimbursements include uh, equipment damages or losses as well. So the, currently what we're uh, looking at is, is uh, an all found rate for equipment and personnel, including fuel and equipment. So it's, uh, it's pretty standard uh, uh, throughout BC. And I know that there are some communities within the CSRD that do not do highway rescue. Uh, unfortunately, we are one of those. And, well, I, I, I know our fire trucks, $2 million or, or close to that that we paid. Uh, it seems, I, I don't know what we get back per call, but it doesn't seem to be equity. Uh, if the province is benefiting from the municipal uh, contribution to the, the equipment for a loan is one thing, but then I'm sure the this labor costs are significant for every call. Through your worship to Councillor Elliott, the um, the rescue truck, uh, known as Rescue 7, was uh, fundraised for and fully paid for by donations. I believe it did not come from the taxpayers a dollar at all. So that was an uh, awesome effort, and I believe the uh, uh, hospital auxiliary played a big hand in that. And uh, so the, the cost reimbursements, of course, the volunteers go out on the, on the call, so they do receive a small amount through their stipend to their society. And... Um, so it's, it's not a big cost to the city. There are some costs mostly for maintenance and insurance and that sort of thing, but actually operating it on a, on a regular basis, those 115 calls are, are not a, an onerous uh, burden upon the city at all. It's a, a well-deserved service for the traveling public. Okay. Thank you, Chief. I just want to add to that uh, for councillors' uh, benefit. Definitely, uh, previous mayor uh, had fundraised or, or looked at uh, um, funding from the Lottery Corporation, and I think that's where a lot of the money came from. Um, so, so a couple mayors ago, that that was brought in. Uh, Councillor Palmer, you have a comment or a question. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, question on the MVA. Uh, so what percent of the MVAs are within our municipal, our fire service area compared to the outside? Through Your Worship to uh, Councillor Palmer, I don't have a specific numbers on uh, inside and outside the, the area B boundaries as well. Uh, I do know that 12 of those um, uh, incidents uh, sorry, correction, I believe it was 16 uh, MVIs were within the municipal boundaries. And then we considered all the other ones uh, to be outside of municipal boundaries. So area B would be included in the, uh, in the um, uh, general area for between, say, Three Valley Gap and the Golden area. Uh, sorry, Rogers Pass on the Golden side. 
And uh, on, on MVAs, do we recover anything from ICBC? Through your worship, uh, to Councillor Palmer, no, there's uh, typically no recoveries from ICBC. It's all done through uh, EMBC. So that we can only get uh, recoveries from one, one source at a time. The EMBC has been uh, a big supporter of uh, road rescue services and ext extrication in uh, British Columbia. And uh, they're the ones that, that do that funding. I know the Fire Chiefs Association of BC has been lobbying for a number of years now to, uh, to get the reimbursement rates increased to a more realistic level. To, to help uh, those fire departments that do pay their members <coughs> that, that go on the calls. Um, so just uh, further to that, so EMBC, so that's what those outside our fire, so the MVAs or MVIs, I guess you're calling them, within the city, uh, there wouldn't be any recovery at all from those. And, and is there any opportunity from ICBC for uh, like I think, for example, if there is uh, MVA that's in city infrastructure that we can uh, go after uh, ICBC for recovery of costs um, for damages, but I'm just wondering on the response or if I'm just not even sure if we're able to, if there's any possibility for that or if it's been a discussion item. Through your worship to Councillor Palmer, the, um, the it's, it's a good question that it's it's difficult to uh, separate sometimes. So anything that's within the the municipal boundaries is the responsibility of the city to to respond for and cover those costs. Uh, when we look at um, organizations like uh, the BC Ambulance, they they're uh, the the general population of uh, BC pays uh, into those costs as a collection. And so in within Revelstoke, we're, we're paying into that as well. We don't get any recoveries uh, within our city limits. Not to say that if a uh, vehicle accident that resulted in uh, an extrication or something like that, that the city could not go after uh, damages uh, to ICBC for uh, damage to park benches or, or, or lights or, or any of those sorts of infrastructures. Um, but the service of the fire department or ambulance or police to assist those people is generally not uh, charged back through ICBC unless there's an injury or some other event that uh, actually comes to, to uh, gets into court or into a lawyer's <laughs> litigation. I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, so in general, in general, I, and, I, and I guess it's a, sort of a, a point like ICBC over the last uh, several years, decade, I guess, has been very aggressive of uh, recovering costs, their costs. And uh, so specifically, if there's a motor vehicle accident uh, that there's uh, the fire department's called specifically as a result of the accident, I think there's an argument to be made that ICBC should be paying for those those costs um, through the their the insurance. That's a, a point, maybe something to think about. Um, the uh, the losses you talked about the losses, so it's like double order of magnitude, double of what it's been for the last four years in 2020, and you attributed some of that to um, uh, probably to uh, increase real estate values, and that's probably accurate, but probably not that order of magnitude double. It's, it seems a little concerning, and I'm I'm wondering if, if, you know, what, and I'm sure you're thinking about some of those things too, if, if it, the number of fires, you know, big damages that are happening, because it seems your incidents are going down, but the, the, the values are up a lot. Um, and so it's not the little things that are, it's, uh, what's creating those big losses and is it because we're pushing too many people into you know illegal suites and that kind of thing which is you know quite concerning um, so it's just I, I certainly observed that you know in your presentation and um, uh, probably nothing really to be said more on it other than I, I think definitely it, it warrants some more discovery as to why that's happening uh, and then finally if I just one more item your worship um, I Good work on uh, doing the, the training to the kids, the uh, programs. Um, 
I, I believe it's effective. I have a colleague that uh, attributes his life to uh, the training from uh, his his child in a, in a fire incident. Um, wondering if uh, on fire training and specifically thinking fire extinguisher training for staff for the city of Revelstoke staff, do, do you? Because most people don't know how to use a fire hydrant or sorry, fire fire extinguisher. And I'm just wondering if uh, it's, it's maybe an opportunity if you're not already doing it. Through your worship to Councillor Palmer, um, your, your last question first. Yes, we are uh, doing fire extinguisher training for the city staff, and we're hoping to uh, get some more, utilize uh, some some additional technology to increase and enhance the the delivery of that for staff. Um, and then back to the first question with the the values. Uh, the increase in values, we need to look at the the actual um, uh, structures that are involved in in fire. For example, you know some of the homes may be higher value homes. Uh, there could be a, a whole slew of different reasons why uh, the values go up. Um, you know, the, we could have had ten fires that were very small fires. There were there were only. Twenty thousand dollars worth of of contents lost, perhaps in 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 the 2019 year, where perhaps in uh, 2020 there were uh, more uh, significant losses or or various things that, that could have increased those values. So there's a lot of things that uh, that go into making up those values, and you're quite right. It's not just the the property values, although I do believe it it does play a, a big part in. The, the inflation plays a big part and the replacement cost. Uh, so there, that's a, a big consideration, but it's not the only part of the picture. You're quite right on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate uh, your report and uh, all you do for our community. Appreciate that. Thanks again. We're going to move on now to uh, community economic development. Uh, so the recovery task force update, which is verbal. Ms. Braun, you're here. We'll leave it to you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see everything? Nope. Do I need to control, Cindy? Um, I am no, you just have to share it at the top yeah. right, Ingrid. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. So thank you. So the purpose of my presentation today is to give you an update as to uh, recent developments with the Recovery Task Force. If you recall, um, left off a presentation that we provided on February 23rd with some of the uh, big issues we're working on and um, we talked about the uh, working in collaboration with the Economic Development Commission and its working group, the Recovery Task Force, as along with our partners at the Business and Visitor Information Centre, and identified these critical issues that we have to uh, work on. I finished the last presentation with uh, kind of a, a list of the tools that we can utilize to support economic and social recovery in the short to medium term, as well as those that will drive future growth and foster that long-term sustainability and, and resiliency. So uh, I've just highlighted a couple of those different programs and I thought I would provide you with some more details on some of these and some new developments. So under our data and impact analysis, we're embarking on a study with tourism on the value of tourism. This will help us to assess the impact of the tourism industry and to communicate the value of tourism to our residents. Um, having a, a clear understanding of the economic contribution of tourism will allow our community to, to explore what our destination strives to, to be as part of our destination development plan long term. And I think it'll also help to go some way towards mitigating some of the potential conflict between residents and, um, and people involved in the tourism industry that we've seen take shape over the, the span of the pandemic. That's taking place now. It's underway right as we speak. Uh, Industry sector analysis is another area we're working in, and this is working together with finance, development services, and our working group of the commission and Okanagan College. And we are going back over five years of business license information to 
code the licenses with the NAIC codes, which is a standard um, industrial code that, that looks at different sectors. Uh, Imagine Kootenai is also supplying us with some economic data, baseline data as part of an agreement with them. And both of these projects will allow us to, to analyze our economic activity sector by sector. And the purpose of this is to both attract investors and to just support business retention and expansion efforts that are part of our department's mandate. Under business services and support, a couple of initiatives taking place right now. I think I did speak a little bit last time about the Community Futures Business Outreach Program. This provides one-on-one -on -one assistance to businesses and it's funded through Western Diversification and the CBT. And Community Futures and the Basin Business Advisor Program both provide these kinds of services. And we work with, together with them quite closely as part of our uh, business retention and expansion. So uh, we have an opportunity, we're in the middle of an applying to sit it for more funding to continue this program um, beyond the, the uh, current time period that Community Futures has led it. And that will allow uh, Chamber of Commerce to continue to support the business outreach and communications as well as help develop a CRM, which is a content resource management system to share information on industry uh, business, business inf information between our different partners at the BVIC. So the purpose of this is to assist those vulnerable sectors and again to, to um, implement our business retention and expansion program and this should kick off this year and continue through the rest of 2022. Idea Factory, we're almost there. Uh, construction is underway right now and Community Futures has stepped up and is supporting the Fabrication Lab with funding as well as uh, the funding we have in place from the Rural Dividends Fund and the EOF funds from the CSRD. And, um, Community Futures is able to use some of the recovery funds to support the build out, understanding that the, the ability to respond to the needs of industry, whether it's digital adaptation or developing new tools and resources has been quite, quite critical to their recovery. Uh, we've seen some of the programs they've involved in already, like the face masks that they produced and uh, the lighting system they produce that mimics the railway system for stores for customers coming in and out. This will contribute to our long-term sustainability as well as our response and recovery and it'll continue through to 2023. Um, another change is our programming and meeting space as part of the renovation, supported again by rural dividends, EOF funding, and possibly some of the COVID recovery funding. And this is going to again allow us to work with businesses to adapt to uh, the changing business climate, to uh, look at digital innovation, to attract investors in kind of new and emerging sectors, and to support community and recreation groups as they kind of come out of the recovery. So uh, being able to provide businesses in those vulnerable sectors especially with services and training will help them to retain and grow their businesses and recover in the long term. Permitting and licensing, another tool that we have, development services, uh, again, is going to be coming to you in the future with uh, an opportunity to extend the patio season and permit outdoor expansion, retail spaces and waive fees for 2021. Purpose of this is to support physical distancing and public health, work with our hardest hit sectors, including retail and, and hospitality and support tourism recovery. So that's similar to what we did last year and Marianne will be bringing that forward in future, near future, I believe. And lastly, infrastructure and grants. Um, infrastructure grant story, we have a number of applications in. Uh, the one we have heard back on definitively at this point is the CEREP grant, which is a provincial government community economic recovery program for 947,000. And that's in partnership with RMR and the LSLIB to implement a portion of our trail strategy, leverage RMI funding and connect it downtown to the resort for visitors and commuters and residents. So this is part of our trail strategy that looked at creating a multiple our multiple multi-use pathway that's accessible between the resort and downtown it'll also leverage our um, visitor information signage and our wayfinding signage strategy that has resources to provide information to people using the trails and that concludes my presentation are there any questions council uh, any questions Okay, Councillor Elliott, you have a question? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, Ingrid, uh, the Fab Lab, uh, the Idea Factory, it was, uh, do you have a time when it's due to be on online or when, when is it expected to be completed, the construction project? Um, I'm going to guess 
that we should be looking at May at some point. We're hoping to have everything completed downstairs prior to tourism season. That's the accessible washrooms and the upstairs as soon as possible after that. But I'd have to get back to you with a full timeline from the contractor. I've actually asked the architect recently to provide us with an update on on the uh, the timing. There's been a few delays with windows and uh, we've had to do some repair work on those as well as kind of redoing our planned um, tech wiring of the new space to accommodate some of the some of the program I just spoke about. So that'll take a bit longer as well to implement that, but that's been approved and is, is underway right now. Yeah, that's where I was going. I just was wondering how, how you know, whether it was on track, what your expectations were. Uh, the other question to that is, is it on budget? Uh, so far, yes, we we are still within our budget that we that we set up when we brought this to council for approval. Uh, again, I've asked the architect for a full um, updated schedule of timing and additional costs. So I'll be able to share that with you soon in the future. Great, great. And then uh, may I go uh, one more, Gary, or Councillor Elliott? Um, mass transit. Uh, the federal government has come up with a thirty billion dollar. Uh, funding proposal that's uh, dealing with mass transit, greening the uh, the transit systems that are uh, in place across the country. They're looking at uh, electric buses, looking at all kinds of ways to, to, to move towards green. Do you think we are ready or ready to approach that, uh, that funding source to, uh, with something that we can, we could draw up to, that might gain some funds for our community? I would, uh, through your worship, I would defer that question to the Director of Engineering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we are involved in, in the transportation through engagement and supporting some of the shuttle services with RMI funding, but as to the actual future BC Transit services, I, I couldn't yeah. speak to that. Oh, yeah. I, I know Steve's working on it. Uh, very, very, uh, he's trying to be, find something very, very good for our community. But I just thought, uh, I've been reading quite a bit about it, and, and there's a lot of money out there right now. I just thought I'd ask. All right. Thank you. Right. Any other questions, councillors? Uh, Councillor Palmer. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just further to Councillor Elliott's uh, comments there on transportation. I, I, I'm, I think there's this opportunity right now to make our transit make sense, and it's it's true that. Uh, Transit is working with uh, some of the major urban areas for uh, converting their buses to electric and stuff, but we really need to rethink well, how we're doing it. I think it's a uh, travesty that we are have buses going around empty the way we do. Uh, everybody knows that it would be cheaper just to be using taxis than, than the way we're currently functioning. I'm not suggesting that's the solution, uh, um, but I, I would really like to see us work a lot harder on, we could be, we could be a leader uh, in, British Columbia leader in Canada, it possibly going to an Uber type system, uh, doing curbside pickup of it to re replace what we have with the technology. So we're we're doing all this stuff like with the Idea Factory. Hopefully, with this investment, we could become leaders in in innovative approaches and get away from this fossil fuel waste and uh, be serious about some of the state statements we make about climate change. Um, so I would really encourage uh, staff, uh, you know, to really put their heads together. How can we be innovative, not be the, the, these bureaucracies that just protect existing uh, modes of uh, operating and specifically with the our empty bus sy syndrome that we have in Revelstoke. So I, I just encourage that. Thank you, Your Worship. Great. Thank you, Councillor Palmer. Um, we know that staff are already having conversations with uh, BC Transit and how things are being operated and looking for a better way and a more concise way. So I appreciate those comments because that kind of falls into what staff are looking at us already. Any further comment, uh, Councillor Braun? I mean, Ms. Braun, sorry. <laughs> Not at this time, thank you, Your Worship. All right, Councillors, any further comment? Councillor Palmer, did you have another question? Yeah, I think uh, Councillor Elliott had his hand up before me, but. Uh, Councillor Elliott, you're oh, done? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it was I forgot to take it down. My apologies. Uh, yeah, Your Worship, just on, on the BC Transit, I know we're giving lip service to doing things differently, but uh, the, the whole uh, survey that we did, just did with BC Transit is 
is the traditional model. We're going to be coming back with doing little tweaking, tweaking to uh, how the uh, the bus is currently run. It would not really make any substantive difference. And this has been a repeated pattern over a long period of time. And making little tweaks under the current model is not going to address good service, reduce costs, environmental uh, uh, looking after climate change issues, sustainability. Uh, and so I think there really needs to be a shakeup on how we're thinking. And so just to give the rhetoric that staff are working with BC, BC uh, Transit uh, is, is one thing, but can we actually do something of, sub of substance rather than the status quo pretending that we're doing something when we're really just making tiny little tweaks. And I know this is not the venue for that whole discussion, but I would just, I'm going to challenge that when we just, it's basically status quo. Um, Great. So that's my comments. All right, thanks, appreciate your comments. Uh, I'm gonna go back to what I said before, staff are working at it and looking at it from a different perspective, not just giving lip service to it. Councillor Sherlett, you have a comment. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I've been sitting in on the BC Transit conversations uh, for the last few years, I think, because I feel the same way and I appreciate you bringing it up continually, uh, Councillor Palmer. I think it's something we do need to come keep front and centre. It is easy to slide into those old habits, but the impression I've gotten from BC Transit since I first went to their strategic planning, oh, I think it was like two years ago now, uh, and met the new CEO at the time, a uh, young woman named Erin, I can't remember her last name, uh, but she made an impression on me. They BC Transit really is trying to come forward into the new millennia <laughs> uh, and really be smart about how they make their decisions. And I hope I left an impression on how Revelstoke is keen to be a partner in that. Uh, the Collective Impact Transport Active Transportation Group has been a big part of this as well, really pushing BC Transit and holding them to account um, to make sure that they don't take the normal road and hopefully we have that combined with our trans we'll transportation master time. plan to have some cool stuff happen Anyways, i'll leave it at that but thank you great thanks councillor chalette miss Lowe, you have a comment you're muted okay yes i do i just wanted to refer back to the permitting and licensing um topic it says from development services with respect to extending the patio season and um, reducing the fees for encroachments. And just wanted to get a feel if there's any concern about that from council, because time is of the essence and I don't want to spring a bylaw on you for readings at the next meeting if, if you're not in support of that. So just so, looking for some discussion. Okay, uh, we had talked about this before and I think uh, had our uh, fees and charges bylaw gone through, we would have uh, probably dealt with most of that. So, councillors, any comments about doing what we did last year for the community with patios and allowing them to uh, put them out because it is now uh, to the point where we may be able to get them out earlier and yeah. uh, and uh, and not charging any further fees. So is there kind of general support for that sort of thing so that uh, it can be brought forward to the council meeting? So I see two thumbs up, uh, 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 three, four, uh, Councilor Ryan, you're in support as well. Yep, so we're all in support of that, Ms. Lowe. Um, so if you want to bring that forward to the next council meeting, that would be uh, a wonderful thing. So we um, still, oh, sorry, Your Worship, sorry. we still have no. the ability to do all three readings and adoption um, from our ministerial order. So we'll bring that forward at the next council meeting. And then I will leave the actual date um, up to operations with um uh, Mr. Black to decide when a good time is to allow them to come out. But if, if council supports an earlier date, then then we'll make that happen. Yeah, that seems like a prudent choice if uh, okay. council's in support of that. Mr. Black, any comment on that? No, Your Worship. Uh, we're just waiting on uh, the, the time that we can clean everything and not have to worry too much about additional snowfall. As you may be aware, we did start cleaning up the downtown area with uh, removing gravel from all the curb returns. And so we're trying to get ahead of the mat of the game here and <laughs> and move forward as quickly as we can to achieving the goals of uh, supporting the community. Great, thank you. Councillor Palmer, you have your hand up. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, it was just further to the uh, bus uh, uh, transit uh, stuff. So, um, again, uh, I know you were, I felt it was a refute of what I was saying, but the BC Transit uh, survey that just went out had leading questions for a, essentially a status quo style of service. I agree 100% with Councillor Shirley on the uh, that there's staff people, including our economic development officer and our director of engineering, that are keen and have aspirations for a, a, a more sustainable mode of transit. And yet we're still caught in the bureaucratic systems. And in discussion that I had, uh, I guess it was almost two years ago with uh, BC Transit representatives, they were saying, really, it's going to take the initiative from council to have the substantive change on how we're providing services. Uh, there's a model that's working right now is for BC Transit in smaller communities. It is not innovative. And so I it will take the leadership from council if we really want to change on how transit services are provided. Um, and, and I know this isn't necessarily the venue for that ongoing dis discussion, but it's on there. And uh, I, I'm making a statement that I think there's more that we can do as council on meeting and meeting those uh, needs for the long long term instead of having a traditional tr transit model that we have today. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Great. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Palmer. It wasn't my intent to refute what you were saying. It was just to say that we are looking at this stuff, even if it's only internally. But I agree with you. It will take council directive to move forward. Thank you again. Any further comments on uh, anything, councillors? Okay, I'm going to ask for termination of the meeting. If someone want to make that motion, please. Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Brooks Hill. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you all. Thank you, staff. Thank you, councillors. Appreciate your time. This meeting is now terminated.